Okay, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker without any further ado. So our guest speaker today is Kurt Barnes, and Kurt comes to us from Silver Creek Fellowship in Silverton, and we have a long-standing relationship with that church, and we just can't help but think of all the years of all the service that your church has done for New Frontiers, and part of that past history has just been really awesome. Uh, You guys don't know it, but a lot of the groundwork for all of our STEP classes This guy has really been instrumental in helping to prepare us to be able to equip you through each of the steps that we're going through. And Kurt, I just want to thank you and your father as well, too, for extending your time and energy and coming here and just really blessing us with your presence. This guy loves Jesus. Mm -hmm. It's really obvious. His passion, his heart is for kingdom business. And so let's give a big round of applause for Kurt. Thank you. That. You can do this. All right, amen. Well, he told you, I'm Kurt. That's my name. I lead the church in Silverton, Silver Creek Fellowship. We have had a long time relationship with you all here at the River Center. It's been just an awesome privilege for me and my dad, Rob, to walk through this uh, last year with your team and the staff here as they uh, laid this foundation for Next Step. I'm going to make a plug for Next Step. Because I believe one of the things that's helped to transform the church that I lead in Silverton has really been not that just next step is sort of class that you go to, but really us as a church embracing and seeing that God has a desire for each and every one of you here to continue growing each and every day in your walk with Jesus to become more and more like him. Now that sounds great. We all would agree to that. Yeah, let's become more like Christ. But how do we do it? Well, the how to is next step. In the next step process, we're actually tangibly coming together and learning about the next steps we can take in our walk with Jesus to become more and more like him. In step one, you learn about belonging to the local church. In step two, you learn about the habits of healthy discipleship. In step three, how God uniquely shaped you for ministry. In step four, how you can share that to the ends of the earth. God has a plan by bringing you more and more into his image to see the city of Lebanon saved with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? So next step is more than just something because we couldn't figure out anything more to do with Sunday nights or Saturday mornings, okay? Next step is really a strategic way that we all together can be marching together, becoming more like Jesus. And so I just highly recommend to you, if you haven't started yet or if you've started, I just keep going. Keep going, keep pressing forward, because I believe God will meet you in this, and it's going to be a huge blessing for you all as a church, just as it has been for mine. Now, I want to introduce uh, my family. Actually, whenever I speak somewhere, I like to show this, because this is such a big part of my life. This is uh, my wife, Summer, my high school sweetheart, uh, who married since 2004. I stopped doing the math, because I get it wrong each time. I remember the year we were married, just not how long that's been. And then this is our boy, Keegan, here. He's uh, seven years old in the first grade and our daughter Kyler uh, she's a preschooler this year for the very first time so they were all going to be here with me today except that being as it's the second week of school they've all come down with the second week of school cold and flu bug and so we thought we'll not share that with all of you this morning Um, and so I came on my own So one of the things I want to say before I jump into the message today is um, we all pray for you and your team and your church in Silverton every week on Tuesday mornings. Our team gathers and prays, and one of the items on our prayer list every single week is your church family, your church body, and the leaders of your church. We love you guys. We're so glad to be partnered together with you all in the gospel. When Warren reached out to me and asked me if I would come and share today, it was 100%. Of course, I would love to because we really see uh, our churches as partnered together for the good news to see the gospel spread to the ends of the earth. Amen? Okay, so here's the big idea for today's message. In case some of you are already at the end of your attention span, I want to go ahead and give you the big idea so that if you check out, first you'll hear this uh, from me. So the big idea today and the card that you got on your way in says, who is your one? Who is the one person that you are willing to commit to praying for and sharing your faith with in the next calendar year? 
You see, we so often make things more complicated than they need to be. But just imagine with me, if you would, if we all together took this idea seriously this morning. If each person here gathered together today or those who are going to watch this message online made a commitment to God to pray for this one person to really devote ourselves to praying and to serving and to sharing our faith with them inside of the next calendar year, what impact do you think that would have on your local church? What impact do you think that would have on the city of Lebanon? What impact do you think that would have on this southern part of the Willamette Valley? You know, it's really easy for us in an active church where there's lots of announcements. Dennis, I don't know how you do that. Um, sit in here and watch yourself on the screen do those announcements. That's, that's a whole nother thing. But in the church, it's lots going on. There's something it's easy for us to do. It's easy for us to get caught up in all of the activity and all of the movement, but fail to recognize a vitally important thing, your role to play in that movement. And it's easy in a growing church to sit on the sidelines. You're a sports town here close by. I'm sorry um, about last night for many of you who are still grieving the loss of the beavers. But uh, in a sports community, you get this analogy. It's easy for us. Did I, I pick? It's too soon. I'm sorry. Um, it's easy for us to watch the players on the field from the stands but fail to recognize that we weren't called to be spectators and watch the game, but to be participants and to give our lives and to put ourselves down on the field and on the playing surface. So what I want to help you do today is to see how you can get involved, how you can get engaged, how you can enter on to the playing field, and that's going to start one person at a time. So to dig into this today, we're going to be in Luke chapter 5, verse 17 through 26, if you have your Bible today. That's where we're going to spend most of our time. Um, but before we jump into the text, I always like to give the context of where this text comes from in the story, in the big narrative story of the gospel. So at this point, in Luke chapter 5, Jesus has gathered his team of disciples and he started, he's kicked off his public ministry. He's been healing the sick in the towns, primarily now all spent around his hometown, the town of Nazareth, around the Sea of Galilee. So he's been spending his time near the place where he's grown up, and he's just recently healed a man from leprosy. He healed a man from leprosy, and he did something that actually when you read it, you think, this is kind of crazy. After he heals the man from leprosy, he tells him, now, don't tell anyone about it. And you think, now wait a minute. You just were healed from the worst possible disease imaginable in the time frame. You were sent back to the priest to show yourself to the priest. Don't you think he had some questions to ask to the man who had just been healed? Do you think that the guy said, yeah, I don't know how I got healed yet? No, of course he told them all exactly what had happened. And we're going to see that in the text. It says in Luke 5, verse 15, But despite Jesus' instructions, the report of his power spread even faster. The vast crowds came to hear him preach and to be healed of their diseases. But Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. So Jesus has just begun his public ministry, and already from the very get-go, crowds are beginning to form. And that's where we see our text today, Luke 5, verse 17. One day, while Jesus was teaching, some Pharisees and teachers of the religious law were sitting nearby. It seemed that these men showed up from every village in all of Galilee and Judea, as well as from Jerusalem. And the Lord's healing power was strongly with Jesus. Okay, so Jesus is already starting to get the attention of the religious leaders. And I want you to notice something. It says that local level religious leaders were there, but also national level religious leaders were there as well. It says that some of the religious leaders present that day were from Jerusalem. Now, we have to remember the role that these religious leaders played in the first century Jewish world. This would kind of like me, uh, the best uh, analogy I could give for us would be like we had a meeting and some of your local city council members were here. Some state representatives also joined us 
and the U.S. senators were also present. Can you picture this? This is, this is a big, wide reach of leaders who were there to hear what Jesus had to say. In fact, when John the Baptist was out in the desert preaching and baptizing, in the book of John, it tells us that in Jerusalem, from the temple, they sent out some of these religious leaders to find out who John the Baptist says he was. Who does John the Baptist say that he is? And what is he doing out there in the wilderness? And John the Baptist is going to answer them with a crystal clear answer. Look at this in John chapter 1, verse 19. This was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders sent priests and temple assistants from Jerusalem to ask John, who are you? He came right out and said, I am not the Messiah. Well then, who are you, they asked. Are you Elijah? No, he replied. Are you the prophet we're expecting? No. Well then, who are you? We need an answer for those who have sent us. What do you have to say about yourself? Okay, so now Jesus is on the scene, and the crowds have gathered, and rumors have been spreading about Jesus performing miracles. So the powers that be in Jerusalem have sent out their investigators once again to find out who this guy is and who he says he is. So let's see how Jesus responds to their questions and compare them to how John the Baptist responded, okay? So let's go back to Luke chapter 5. Now we're in verse 18. It says, Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. They tried to take him inside to Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So they went up on the roof, took off some tiles, then they lowered the sick man on his mat down into the crowd right in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, Young man, your sins are forgiven. But the Pharisees and teachers of the religious law said to themselves, Who does he think he is? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Now, this is an important question. Who does he think he is? Because this question is going to keep coming up over and over again all throughout the Gospels. Who does he say he is? Or who does he think he is? Who is this man? Jesus even asks his disciples on another uh, occasion. He says, who do they say that I am? Jesus one day stood on top of a boat in the middle of a huge storm. And he commanded the winds and the waves to be still. And they instantly obeyed. And the disciples, it said, looked at each other and said, Who is this guy? Even the winds and storms obey him. This question is the single most important question that any person will ever have to face. Who is Jesus? It is the most important question that we human beings face on this planet and that we have to think about and wrestle. Who is Jesus? And I don't want you to miss this. Jesus is about to answer these guys' question in a really big way. So remember the question on the table. Verse 22. Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sin. Now, real quick, you might have missed something here. You might have missed something that Jesus just said that I promise you the religious leaders that were sent from Jerusalem did not miss. Here in this text, we learn one of Jesus' many names. It's the very first time in the gospel that this name is used by Jesus to refer to himself. That name is the Son of Man. And remember, what was the question that they were asking in their hearts that prompted Jesus to use this name? In their hearts, they were saying, who is this guy? Who does he think he is? And Jesus answers their question by using this name, the Son of Man of man. It's used 23 times for Jesus in the Gospels, and it's an important name because it's actually one of those names that was given to the coming Messiah in the Old Testament. And this was not a fact that was missed by the religious leaders of the day. In fact, in Daniel's messianic vision in chapter 7 of Daniel, this is what it says. 
As my vision continued that night, I saw someone like the Son of Man coming with clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient One and was led into His presence. He was given authority, honor, and sovereignty over all the nations of the world so that people of every race and language and nation would obey Him. His rule is eternal. It will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. Now Jesus just referred to himself as the Son of Man. That same Son of Man that has authority, that has honor, that has sovereignty over all nations, every race, tribe, nation, and tongue, the same Son of Man that would rule eternally, Jesus just used that name for himself. Remember when John the Baptist was asked who he was? How did he answer the question? I'm not the Messiah. Not me, nope. But now here's Jesus right off the bat. First question. I'm the son of man. And he goes even further. He says, and I will prove to you that the son of man. So this is what happens next. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat and go home. And immediately as everyone watched, the man jumped up, picked up his mat and went home praising God. Everyone was gripped with great wonder and awe, and they praised God, exclaiming, We have seen amazing things today. Amen. They had seen some amazing things. So here's what I want to do with you. For the remainder of our time together, I want to focus on part of this story that I just find amazing. I want to focus on this group of friends that brought their friend who couldn't walk to see Jesus. I want to look at these friends who brought their friend to see Jesus, and I want us to actually be able to learn from their example together this morning as we're thinking about, as we're praying about this idea of who is your one. Because I think some of the things that we learn from them are going to be helpful for us as we really press in and press forward in this idea, who is your one. So here's the very first thing. If you're a note taker, uh, you can write these down. If not, you can just remember these. But the first one that I just, it jumps off the page to me, is these men that brought their paralyzed friend to see Jesus. They had a mission. They had a mission. Now, I know you guys have been in a series where you've been talking a lot about mission. And it's important because mission is what gives us direction. Mission is what drives us as individuals, whether it's in the the public sector, the private sector, or in our church family culture. Some of you even have mission statements for your families. Some of you have those signs in your kitchen, you know, or above your fireplace that says things like, in this family we do hugs, or this family we have messy kitchens, but happy children, whatever your sign might say. We've got mission statements even for our families. Well, we have mission statements for our churches at the River Center. Your mission statement reads, Advancing the kingdom of God by building faith communities where members are empowered by the Holy Spirit to live gospel-centered lives. At Silver Creek Fellowship, the church that I pastor, our mission statement is discovering God's dream for our lives. Now we add detail by loving Jesus, by being part of God's family, by becoming more like Jesus, by serving in the church, and by sharing the good news to the ends of the earth. But mission statements are around us everywhere in our society. I've got just a few of them here from the business world that you can see today. Instagrams uh, is to capture and share the world's moments. Amazon's is to be the earth's most customer-centric company where people can find and discover anything they want to buy online. Google. Google's mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. I added a bonus one for Facebook. A media platform used by your grandma to keep uh, tabs on your grandchildren. Except now your grandkids no longer use the platform because they switched to Instagram. And then when you switch to that, they switch to Snapchat. Now they're on TikTok, but that's another story. Did you know that Jesus himself had a mission statement? Jesus told us in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. So let me ask you, what was the defining mission 
of these men that brought their friend to Jesus that day? What was the thing that they wanted to see happen? They wanted to see their friend walk, right? They wanted to see their friend healed. They had a mission. They wanted to see their friend restored. They wanted to see him whole. They wanted to see him healthy. So I've got some questions for you to think about today. And these are real questions. These are meant to to go home with you. These are meant to stir you. These are meant to make you think. I, I want you to think about these things. What spiritually... What things spiritually are driving you? What has God put in your heart for you to see come to fruition in your lifetime? When was the last time you stopped and thought about those dreams? Parents, do you have dreams about seeing your kids come to faith in Jesus? Do you have driving passion to see co-workers come to faith? Do you have kingdom dreams? Do you long for the kingdom of God to come and the will of God to be done on earth as it is in heaven, in and through your life? Or are we satisfied with the moment and the way that things are? I love uh, Jim Cimbala. He wrote a book that I read uh, many years ago, and I've quoted it a lot in my preaching. It's from the 90s during the renewal movement. The book is called Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. And there's a statement that stuck with me. In fact, it's written on my desk. It's on a little piece of paper under my monitor, and it says this. I despaired at the thought that I might let my life slip by without God showing himself mighty on my behalf. Would that describe you? I love this quote. I despaired at this thought. Do you have kingdom dreams? Does the thought of going through life without seeing God's power move because of your faith, does that make you despair? What is the mission that you have to see your friends saved? Maybe this will help some of you. Maybe some of you here today are just not sure what that mission might be. Well, I would encourage you, why don't we just adopt Jesus' mission? Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. So these men had a mission. They wanted to see their friend walk. Here's the next thing. They also had an eager expectation. They believed that Jesus could heal their friend. Why else would they have brought their friend to Jesus? Why else would they have climbed up on a roof And tore it open if they didn't believe that getting their friend to Jesus would change everything. I want you to think for a minute about how big a risk this was for these men. They climbed up on a stranger's roof and tore a hole in it. If this was your house, how would you feel about this? They ripped a hole in the roof and lowered a man down. And I think it's one of the things that we can read these Bible stories and really miss out on is this question. Listen, friends, in Luke chapter 4, chapter 5, how much did people know about Jesus at this time? It's not like we are today. They didn't have the Gospels to read. They hadn't received the gift of the Holy Spirit to bring everything to mind and memory. In this day, they just had word of mouth that had spread from just a few things as Jesus had just begun his ministry. People didn't know who Jesus was yet, and yet they were still willing at great risk to bring their friends before Jesus. Friends, the Bible is full of people who took a risk Because they wanted to come in contact with Jesus. Let me ask you a real question. What was the last time you took a risk for God? What was the last time you tried something that if God did not show up, you were not going to be successful? Because friends, that's faith. When we do only that which we have the natural ability to do ourselves, it doesn't require any faith. But when we go out and say, you know what? I don't have the power to do this. I can't do this myself, but I believe that God will show up on my behalf. It takes faith to believe for that. And friends, far too often we're living life by our own natural abilities. 
when God is encouraging us uh, to live a supernatural lifestyle, empowered by His Holy Spirit in and through us. Friends, if these guys believed enough to carry their friend to Jesus with as little as what they knew and understood about Jesus in the first century, how much more should you and I, who have the gospel, who have the Holy Spirit, be willing to take a risk and bring our friends before Jesus? See, we often forget what an incredible advantage we have over the people who lived in the Bible times. We so often think, if only I could have been there and seen that. But friends, we have so much more than that. We have the indwelling of the person, the Holy Spirit, living in us, confirming to us that God's word is real and true and instructing us and teaching us, advocating for us, comforting us, counseling us, helping us. We have God himself in us and through us because of Jesus' death and resurrection. Friends, you and I have everything necessary for us to see his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So I got some more questions. Do you have an eager expectation for friends, for family members, for neighbors, for co-workers? Do you have an expectation that God would move through you to help other people come to faith? And does that expectation, that eagerness, does it move you to action? Because it's more friends than just wanting something or thinking about something, this is really where we say, no, I'm going to be a doer of the word and not just a hearer. Okay, so these men, they had a mission. They wanted to see their friend walk. And they were willing to go for it. But look what happens when they get started. Number three is they encounter an obstacle. They encounter an obstacle. And you can just count on this, friends. They get there and what's happened? They've got this plan. We're going to go see Jesus. He's going to heal our friend. Great. They get there and there's a giant crowd. There's no way in to see Jesus. And it's at this point that many of us simply give up. We walk away. We say these uh, Christianese things like, well, it must not have been God's will. Because if it was God's will, he would have opened the people like the Red Sea and we would have just walked right into Jesus. And since that didn't happen, I guess we'll turn around and go home. So we throw up the white flag of surrender and we use excuses to justify us. But the truth is, friends, if there's no way in, if there's no way forward, maybe, friends, we need to look for another door. Imagine with me for a moment if the Apostle Paul only walked through open doors where red carpets were rolled out for him throughout the New Testament. How much of the New Testament would we have? Not very much, because if you know the story, he came against obstacle after obstacle after obstacle after difficulty after difficulty. But it was the perseverance in the face of that difficulty where he began to really walk forward and to persevere in faith that built his courage and built his strength. Friends, far too often, the enemy is able to distract us and get us off course by putting minor obstacles in our way. And some of you have encountered these closed doors with family members, with friends, with your kids, with your grandkids, with your neighbors, with your co-workers. And they've led us to a place where we just feel really beaten down in the current culture that we live in. We're afraid to share our faith. We're afraid to tell other people about the hope that we have with gentleness and respect. We're afraid to enter into these dialogues because we don't want to be seen as one of them or one of them or one of those. So we keep it to ourselves. But do you remember the song we taught you in Sunday school? Hide it under a bush. What did we say? Oh, no. Right? But we're living in a time frame, friends, where we've decided that our faith is so personal with my personal relationship with Jesus, that we just can't talk about it with other people. And it's a huge, huge lie of the devil. Some of you are encountering closed doors and obstacles. And guess what, friends? 
we need to climb up on the roof and dig a hole through the roof because getting our friends and our family members to Jesus is the most important thing we can do. When they saw this obstacle, they didn't despair. The Bible doesn't give us any idea that they came up with. They just kept going. They kept moving towards Jesus. They kept going. And what happens when they get there? They lower their friend down. And I just love this. Verse, the next point, number four. They got way more than they bargained for. They got way more than they bargained for. Not only did Jesus remember what their mission was, to see their friend walk, not only did Jesus heal their friend, which, by the way, that was a successful mission, but Jesus also forgave him of his sins. Jesus didn't just deal with the external circumstances of the man's life. He dealt with a much greater, much deeper need that existed inside of the man's heart. Friends, listen, they didn't even know Jesus had the authority to forgive sins. And yet they brought their friend before him and got way more than they bargained for. In the end of it, I just love how Luke writes it. I'll read it again, verse 26. Everyone was gripped with great wonder and awe. And they praise God, exclaiming, we have seen amazing things today. See, the greatest need that this man or any other man, woman, or child has is not our um, external problems. The paralyzed man had a problem that was actually larger than his inability to walk. And your one, who God will lay on your heart, needs more than just some external tweaking. Okay, They need more than just a self-help, better life transformation in 90 days um, course or healing. They need more than what this world can offer them. They need something only Jesus can offer them, and that is healing for their souls. They need forgiveness, friends, and that's found only in and through the work of Jesus Christ. And at some point, we need to understand this. At some point, every single one of you in this room were like that paralytic man who was laying on the mat. At some point, someone, someone who loved you, someone who cared about you, whether it was a family member or a pastor or a friend, someone helped to carry you to the feet of of Jesus. Someone was courageous enough, was filled with the Holy Spirit, was willing to speak the truth to you in love. Someone told you who Jesus is, what he's done for you, and how you could be saved. Friends, each of us are like that man who laid on that um, mat. We are unable to help ourselves. We're unable to save ourselves, but somebody cared about you and loved you so much that they were willing to take you before Jesus Christ. So let me ask you this question again. Who is your one? Who is the person, your parent, your child, a co-worker, a neighbor, a friend? Who is someone that right now God would stir in your heart? Friends, Jesus told his disciples, that if we were going to follow him, that he would give us a new task and a new direction, a new mission. It was the one defining characteristic of every single believer. He told us that if we would follow him, he would teach us how to fish for men. And in the end, when he's leaving on his way to be enthroned forever in heaven, he tells us that and gives us this great commission to go and to make disciples of all people and to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and to teach them to obey all of his commandments. He told us he would be with us always to the ends of the age. He's left us here, friends. Does anyone ever wonder why are we still here? Does anyone ever, you look around the world and you think, man, Jesus, why are we still here? Well, he told us. He said, when the gospel was preached to the ends of the earth, then the end would come. He told us we had a mission. 
He told us there was a reason that we were here. And it's more than just we would experience his goodness and his grace. He wants us to do that. But he wants us to do it in such a way that it spills out from our lives into the lives of our neighbors, into the lives of our families. It's more friends than just me and Jesus. Our culture is trying to tell us, no, no, that's between you and God. But friends, saving faith should lead us to living hope-filled lives that causes others to ask about the reason for the hope that we have. Friends, as we live our life for Jesus, empowered by His Holy Spirit, we should stand apart from the world that surrounds us. And that should create in them a question to know of our Father who's in heaven. But friends, a lot of us, if we're honest, have decided that this is not something we're skilled at. We've decided that this is not our natural gifting. We've decided that other more experienced or more professional people should handle this work of evangelism. And so in our Western culture, what we've done is when we think about evangelism, we think about events and or we think about crusades. We think about big events where the gospels preach. Now, do I like crusades? Yeah, I love them. I think they're one of the tools God uses to save people. But friends, by far, the vast majority of people who are going to come to faith in Jesus Christ are not going to come through crusades. They're going to come because a faithful parent, neighbor, co-worker lets them be part of their life and shares with them the reason for the hope that they have. Every statistic that you look up will confirm that truth. In fact, Luis Palau, one of the most gifted evangelist of our time said 94% of all the people that they surveyed came to faith not through a work like his, but through the, their family or friends or neighbors who shared their faith with them. Friends, I believe with all my heart this is the way in which God wants to see the nations, our cities, our valley, our state come to saving faith in Jesus is that you and I remember who we are. And why we exist. And why we're still here. Let me ask you a quick question. Are we still here on earth because God wants us to, uh, what, sin some more? No, that's ridiculous. So why are we still here? Why the moment that we put them down in the baptism water, when well, you're going to do baptism, when they pull them back up, why doesn't God just take us up to heaven? Because he has a purpose for us. He has a plan for us. That we would experience him and his goodness and his provision. That we would walk in his spirit. That his fruit would become abundant in our life. And through that, that many other people would experience his goodness and his salvation. I'm going to read to you a quote from a book that I read 20 years ago. And when I read this book, uh, I was going to Western Baptist College in Salem. It's now called Corbin University, but uh, my bills still say Western Baptist on them, so that's what I call it. Um, and this book, uh, which is by a guy named Daryl Robinson, it's called People Sharing Jesus. And this quote has stuck with me for years, and it, it's really been a challenge to me. And I want to challenge you with it here this morning as we get close to finishing. It says this, Now it came to pass that a group existed who called themselves fishermen. And lo, there were many fish in the waters all around. In fact, the whole area was surrounded by streams and lakes filled with fish, and the fish were hungry. Week after week, month after month, year after year, these who called themselves fishermen met in meetings and talked about their call to fish the abundance of fish, and how they might go fishing. Year after year, they carefully defined what fishing means, defended fishing as an occupation, and declared that fishing is always to be a primary task of fishermen. Continually, they searched for new and better methods of fishing and for new and better definitions of fishing. They created witty slogans and displayed them on big, beautiful banners. These fishermen built large, beautiful buildings called fishing headquarters, 
The plea was that everyone should be a fisherman and every fisherman should fish. One thing they didn't do, however, they did not fish. In addition to meeting regularly, they organized the board to send out fishermen to other places where there was also many fish. The board hired staff and appointed committees and held many meetings to define fishing, to defend fishing, and to decide what new streams should be thought about. But the staff and committee members did not fish. Large, elaborate, and expensive training centers were built whose original and primary purpose was to teach fishermen how to fish. But over the years, courses were offered on the needs for fishing, the nature of fish, and where you could find fish, the psychology of the fish, and how to approach and feed fish without scaring them away. Those who taught had doctorates in fishology, but the teachers did not fish. They only taught about fishing. Year after year, after tedious training, many were graduated and were given fishing license. They were sent to do full-time fishing, some to distant waters, which was filled with fish. Many who felt the call to be fishermen responded. They were commissioned and sent to fish, but like the fishermen before them, they never fished. They engaged in all kinds of other occupations. Some felt their new job was to relate to the fish in a good way so that the fish would know that they're different from the other bad fishermen. Others felt that simply letting the fish know they were nice, land-loving neighbors, and, not, and how loving and kind they were was enough. Now it's true that many of the fishermen sacrificed and put up with all kinds of difficulties. Some lived near the water and bore the smell of dead fish every day. They received the ridicule of some who made fun of their fishermen's clubs and the fact that they claimed to be fishermen yet never fished. Imagine how hurt some were when one day a person suggested that those who don't fish were really not fishermen. No matter how much they claimed to be, yet it did sound correct. Is a person a fisherman if year after year he never fishes? And when I read this the very first time, it stung me deep. Because I realized that I had deeply held convictions about much of what this analogy was referencing. That I knew all kinds of different ways to defend the gospel. That I knew all kinds of different ways to approach people the right way and use the right methods. But one thing, friends, that I wasn't doing... I wasn't actually sharing my life with anybody. I wasn't intentionally investing in relationships. I wasn't finding people and places that I could live my life amongst and share my life with. And friends, I think it's for us today a call to action. If we want to see our city changed, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pry for just a second. If we think that the answer to our city's issues and our nation's issues are political, Friends, then we're not paying attention. Because it's never going to come through the White House or any other way that's going to fix the problems that reside within the heart of man. The only hope for our city and for our nation is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That which you carry, friends, that which you possess, that which you are living and know, and that which we are called to share. So will we be willing to do it? Does what we see in our world grieve us enough to move us out into action? To say yes to God. To say, Holy Spirit, you are allowed to use me wherever, whenever, however you would like to. To be able to say, God, I know these conversations are going to be difficult, but I'm here for this. So you guys have been in a series on prayer. And I think there's no better time as you work through prayer and mission for us this morning to be reminded that through prayer, by praying for this one person, that God wants to do something huge in and through your, this local church. Do you believe that? Do you believe that if you actually spent time praying for a person, looking for opportunities to serve them and love them? Do you believe that God would move on your behalf and that you could see, I'm going to use the word, revival come to your town because the people of God were willing to do the things the way God asked us to do them? That's one person at a time, faithfully living our lives at work, at home, in our neighborhood. Friends, you have neighbors today that are hurting. 
You have neighbors today that are going through a difficult season of life. Will you be willing to be Christ's representative to them? You have family members or friends that are really struggling. Maybe today you could pull out your phone and call them and be that shoulder where they could really unpack the things that are happening and you could pray with them. I believe that God will meet you in this, friends. So here's how I want to close out this service today. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. And as you guys, if you'd be willing, let's stand up. And there's nothing magic about this, but the reason that I'd like you to stand is I would like you just before the Lord for a moment to just stand quietly in God's presence and to let Him convince you. You've heard all the words I have to say, but let's let the Holy Spirit convince us now of His desire to use you to reach the people of your community and to the ends of the earth. And I want to encourage you, if God speaks to you right now as we stand before Him, Take an action step. Write the name down. Put it on your paper. Don't leave this place just thinking, well, that was nice, but I'm not sure where to go next. I'm going to ask right now, Father, would you speak to us? Holy Spirit, would you come and move in this place right now? Stir us up, God. We want to see your kingdom come, God. We want to see people know you and bow their knee now. Because we know a day is coming when every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus your Lord. So God, we want to see our family and our friends make that choice now. On this side of eternity. So come and speak to us, God. Give us courage. Maybe we've tried before to share with a family member or a friend. Maybe it hasn't gone well. I pray for renewed strength this morning. I pray for families that are torn apart. Maybe some of you right here today are estranged from members of your family. I pray for healing to come in Jesus' name. God, I pray for courage for us to live our faith out walk these things that we believe out we don't want to be hearers of your word only we want to be a people who hear and who do and so we ask you God to move in us to stir us to stir us up to help us equip us empower us God to be your hands and your feet upon this earth we see our broken world and God we pray I want to pray just that prayer of Isaiah here I am, send me. Here I am, send me. Lord, we pray for this church. We pray for the city in which you placed it. We pray that revival would come. We pray that the people here, God, would live faithfully to your calling upon their life and that we would see a great harvest. Because Jesus, you told us there's nothing wrong with the harvest. You said the fields were ripe. And God, we agree with you. We see it all around us. So we pray for laborers to be sent out into the harvest. That God, we may see people caught up for you and into your kingdom. We thank you and we praise you today in your perfect son, Jesus' name, who makes all of this worthwhile, all of this possible. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello everyone. Thanks for watching this YouTube video. Hope we've already done this, but if not, hit the like, subscribe, ring the bell. We'd love to stay connected with you. This is a great way if you're out and about to make sure you remain part of what we're doing here at the River Center. There'll be another great video next week. So check it out and hopefully we'll see you soon. Thanks.